Welcome to Casual Friday. Hi, I'm Roxanne Richardson, and this is my weekly Casual Friday podcast. If you would like to jump to a specific point in the video, you can tap or mouse over the video playback area of your screen. That will reveal the chapter titles and links to those sections of the video. Or you can use the timestamped links down in the video description. In this week's podcast, I'll be sharing some tidbits that have come up in my social media feed. I will give you some how-to tips on how to create a project in your Ravelry project notebook. I'll talk a little bit more about Finish It February, which is coming up in just a couple of weeks. And I'll share with you my first completed pair of toe-up socks as well as some historical perspective on sock construction and some new to me vintage sock books that I received in the mail. So let's get started. So I just wanted to give you guys an update on my announcement last Friday that I was not doing a podcast that week. Many of you saw that announcement, so you were aware of what was going on, but there's probably a lot of you who are not aware of why there was no video and and don't know where you would see an announcement like that if that were to happen in the future. So I just wanted to let you know how you can uh, find these things out if you are expecting to see a video and it's not showing up and you don't know uh, what's going on and you might, you might be worried or you might just be wondering what's happening. There are two places where I would make an announcement that there's not going to be a video. One of them is on my YouTube channel using what's called the community tab. So that's a place where I can just do like text posts, I could upload photos or whatever. It's a way to communicate with my YouTube audience in a way that isn't a published, you know, uploaded video. So if you are using the YouTube app on a mobile device, those kinds of posts will show up in your subscription feed. So you will have seen it that way. But if you use YouTube the way I do, which is through a computer browser, like Chrome or Safari, in order to see those kinds of community posts, you actually have to click on community when you are on my channel. So there's a a little menu bar of videos, playlists, and there's one that says community. And so if you were ever wondering, like you wake up on Saturday morning and you're like, well, where's Casual Friday? You could click on the community tab and see if there's been a post of some sort of explanation about what's going on. The other place that you could find out that you could see an announcement that there wouldn't be a video would be in my Ravelry group. And there's always a link to my Ravelry group down in the video uh, a description. And you could go there and you could see if there had been a post about it. And those, so those are the two places where I'd make an announcement. And the reason for that is because that's where the most eyeballs are likely uh, to see those announcements. I have like 6,000 people in my Ravelry group and close to 65,000 subscribe to my channel. And so that's just the way to get get the information out to the most people. But I just wanted to let you know uh, in the future, if you're wondering, I thought there would be a video today. Uh, for casual Fridays, I definitely will make that sort of announcement. Probably not so much for Technique Tuesdays because I do reserve the option just to uh, skip a week on Technique Tuesday every once in a while. But for Casual Fridays in particular, I will make an announcement if it's at all feasible. And in regular times, a lot of times I know well in advance, like if I'm going on a trip or something, I'll let you know and I'll just tell you about it in a video uh, the week before that there won't be one uh, the following week. So this first actual tidbit came up in my Twitter feed this week. It is from the British Library Collection. I'm I'm going to leave you a link down below so that you can look at some of the other images that are part of this. It's called a friendship album. And apparently it was, uh, there were these little books that young men uh, who were from Germany and the Netherlands, um, when they finished their studies and they would travel around Europe and they would uh, see different things and meet different people. And they would, they would um, put together these, these albums of their travels. And sometimes the pictures were cut out of existing books. They were, and, but then over time, it got to the point where sometimes people would commission 
um, specific images be painted like little miniatures and they put them in these friendship albums. And the, the image that, that came up in my feed was basically an image of a stitch and bitch, it's like a 17th century stitch and bitch. These, these aristocratic ladies are sitting around doing uh, various types of needlework, embroidery and tatting and various things like that. And there's snacks on the table and glasses of wine and little puppy dogs running around. And I just thought it was uh, so cool. So, so again, I'll leave that, that link down below um, and you can read about it in the British Library uh, website. This next tidbit has come up in my feed at least once a day for the past week, I believe. I think people are really excited about it. It's like a Zoom conference or Zoom talk type of thing, but you have to register through Event uh, bright and I will leave a link down below. Explore knitting patterns in interwar domestic magazines with Dr. Ellie Reed, who will focus on publications in the knitting and crochet guilds collection. So the interwar period, they're talking about the 1920s and 30s. It says Dr. Eleanor Reed introduces us to knitting patterns, styles, and stitch patterns from interwar women's magazines. Tune in if you are interested in interwar fashion or just into knitting. A booklet containing stitch patterns will be available to attendees. If you want to try some examples out, we'll share a social media hashtag for you to post results to. And the date of that is, I think it's February 4th. I'll, I'll put it on the screen right here and it will be down in the video description as well. I didn't put that in my notes here, but I believe it is February 4th. So if that is something that is of interest to you, you can uh, register for that for free. The Knit and Crochet Guild that they're talking about, that's the UK uh, Knit and Crochet Guild. And they have a huge collection of artifacts as well as patterns in their collection. And one of the things that is available to members is access to the entire uh, collection of Peyton's patterns. So they're not necessarily digitized, I don't think. Uh, so you can't just go look for them and say, I want this pattern. I think you do have to request them. But but um, that this is a resource that I think has really um, become valuable to people, especially since they can't necessarily go and visit these archives and, and see things in person, but you can do the request from any place in the world if you are a member. But again, there was a question that came up in the Ravelry group in the past week about a stitch pattern that was in a book called the Royal Victoria Knitting Book. Uh, I'll leave a link to, to that below. I'm going to be talking about um, that book and that pattern probably next week. But as I was doing some additional research, I found a blog post from 2013 on Queen Victoria and the fact that she was an avid knitter and crocheter as well as spinner. So this blog post I thought was really interesting because what she's talking about is that Queen Victoria, because she was an avid knitter and crocheter herself, she probably really influenced the fact that all girls of all social classes were taught in the 19th century to knit and crochet. And it was ex an expected thing that they would be knitting and crocheting things for their family. So they have some pictures of Queen Victoria knitting, but one of the things that they had was a picture of a crocheted scarf that she had knit. She had knit eight of these for different members of the military who had served in the Boer Wars. And um, which is fascinating to think about that the queen would have crocheted a scarf for specific people. The person who wrote the blog post asked, can you picture any modern head of state doing such a thing for members of his or her national military? And that may be true, but it reminded me that back in November, the EU Commissioner for Home Affairs, her name is, I believe the pronunciation is Ilva Johansson, knit socks for all of the members of her cabinet. And she, I remember seeing this post on Twitter and she had done a little video. She went around this big oval table. All of these socks made with self-striping yarn were at each location and she had made them for each person. I assume that they were holiday gifts because she posted this at the end of November. Um, but I thought that was uh, really fun. And so I'll leave a link to the Twitter 
post where you can see the, the socks that she had knit and that she posted on her Twitter feed. One of the things I do before I start a project, and I've talked about this many times, is I start a project page in my Ravelry notebook. And I've mentioned this many times, but I got a comment a few weeks ago that made me think that some of you don't really understand what the Ravelry notebook is or what a project page in a notebook is. So I wanted to walk through uh, what it is and kind of the basics of how to set up a project in the notebook so that you can uh, learn more about how to use those tools if they are appealing to you and if they would be of use to you. Not every knitter is the same and not every knitter who uses the Ravelry notebook uses it the same way. I use it uh, before I start casting on and I use it during the course of the project and make updates, um, keep notes, um, update the progress, like how, what percentage of the way I'm done with a particular project. But I also use other features of it in order to kind of sort my projects out in different ways. So I wanna walk that through um, for you to show you how to do that and what some of the features are, um, as well as let you be aware of the resources for learning more about using project notebooks. So when we are on Ravelry, we go over to where it says My Notebook. If I just hover over there, I can see a bunch of choices um, for different things that you can keep in your notebook. But we're talking about the project portion of the notebook. So we're going to click on Projects. And here you see all of my projects. And at the top here, I have these sorted into sets. This is an optional thing. You don't have to sort things into sets, but I'll talk about that later. But you can see I have 488 projects in my Ravelry notebook. Um, you can sort them right here. I have them sorted by works in progress, comma, and then recent first, but you can sort them in other ways um, by how happy you are with them, recently started, recently finished, recently added, like the something that you recently added to your notebook. You can sort it by alphabetically, by name, all sorts of ways. You can also filter by the type of craft, you can um, view them in different ways, uh, large photos um, like this uh, versus uh, thumbnails. I choose thumbnails because I can see other information uh, below them. So this is what it looks like once you have things in your notebook. So I'm gonna show you how you go about starting a new project. Over on the left, it says add a project. So I'm gonna click on that and you can select the craft. I always am doing knitting, but there are other crafts that you can keep track of in Ravelry. Um, and then you just give your project a name. So you can call it uh, whatever you want. I'm gonna call it um, a test project so I can delete it later. And then here you can select, I used a pattern, and then you can enter the pattern name. Um, or you can say I didn't use a pattern or you can say the pattern I use not in Ravelry. So I often use I didn't use a pattern when I'm knitting socks because I'm that's something I knit without a pattern or if it's something of my own design I don't I didn't use a pattern. But if you are using a pattern then you could type it in here. So um, I'm trying to think of a, a pattern. I'll just uh, think of one that I've done before that I can think of the name. It's called Ensemble. So I'll type in the pattern name and I'll hit continue. And then it's going to bring me up a, a list of everything that has a name like that, that has Ensemble in it somewhere. There might be a description somewhere in, in some of these. Uh, but the one I'm thinking of is this one. And there's a little red uh, badge on there that shows that that's a free pattern. It shows you how many projects there are, all that kind of stuff. And you can confirm based on the oh, this is from Nitty, that's the one I'm thinking of. Or if you know the designer's name, oh yeah, that's the one I was thinking of. So a lot of times things, there are multiple patterns with the same name, so you just need to confirm. And so I'm gonna choose that pattern. And here is, get, is the place where I can add information about the project. So if I'm making it for somebody, I can, I can say who I'm making it for. So you don't have to fill any of this stuff out. Um, if you have a deadline date, uh, you can say when you want to finish something by, you can say the size. Again, you don't have to fill any of this out. You can just put in the name of the project and then the date that it was finished if you want, or you don't even have to put dates in. If, if, all, if the only reason you want to use your Ravelry notebook is to 
just track that you've made something and you want a photo of it, you can do that. Um, this is where you can keep track of how far you are in your project and that's up to you to update it and you can either update that by estimating oh I think I'm about halfway done or you can, like with me I use spreadsheets that calculate stitch counts and I know exactly how far I am so you can keep track of this in five percent increments all the way up to the end when like if all you have to do is weave in ends or if all you have to do whatever you consider 99 percent done uh, you can do that, but you can also change your status to finished versus hibernating versus frogged. Frog refers to rip it, rip it. In English, frogs say rib it, rib it, and so that's why they call it frogging. Hibernating might mean you don't want it to show up in the, the projects that you're actually working on right now. You want to push it off so you don't see it. Finished is something that you've actually uh, finished. If I'm going to start this today, I can just type today. I can put a date in or I can say today and we'll fill in with today's date. Tags is something that I always use. So whenever I started, I put in whatever the current year is. And then if, if I put it to the side for a long time and I come back to it, any year that I actually work in it on it, I will put that year in here. So oftentimes a pattern might um, show, might I might work in it multiple years. Again, you don't have to use that. Um, so I always put in the year and then I put in what type of project it is. Like if it's a sweater, I'll type in that. If it's something I designed myself, um, I, if I could spell it, um, I might put that into. There are certain tags that I use and these are for my own use, but often, if you are participating in something like a knit along, they'll have a special tag for you to use so that you can actually search Ravelry for any project that has that specific tag. So here is, you can keep track of what needle size you're using. Uh, you can select from the list and choose a needle size. Um, and then the yarns, you can, you can type in here. Uh, it'll, it'll find it a lot. So if I chose something like, um, how you spell this? Barocco? Barocco. Yeah. So I knew it was a Barocco yarn, but I didn't know which one. I could type in Barocco and I could choose, oh, it was this one right here, this chunky one. And then I could even choose the colorway or the closest color it is. Again, you don't have to use this information, uh, but you can. And sometimes uh, the skeins, the number of skeins you use, you don't necessarily know until the end. And so if I, if I use this and at the end, I know that I use 6.5 of it, it will tell me uh, how many grams that is and, and for this particular ball and how many yards. And so I could look at that later, like how much, how much yarn did I use um, for that sweater last time? So if I wanted to knit it again, I, I would know how much I used. You can keep track of where you purchased it and all that. And nobody else can see this information, uh, only you can. Um, but sometimes people want to keep track of that. So you, when you're using a yarn, you can use your stash yarn. Like if you use the feature of Ravelry where you can keep track of your stash on, um, in your notebook, you can add a yarn from your stash if you want to. So here is where you can keep uh, notes. And so you might say, um, just like a lot of times, I'll just put some basic information about what I'm trying to do, or I might put information about somebody's measurements. Like if I'm knitting socks, I might say, oh, they have a nine inch ball of foot, um, 9.5 inch ankle, uh, gauge equals what I, I might put gauge and, and I might put that information in here. Um, and then I can save my changes. You can also put private notes. Like if there's something you don't want someone to read, like you, if you're making a secret project or something like that, you can do private notes. So you save your changes. And so at some point, if I want to add a note like that, it will put the date on there. So I can kind of keep, I can, I can keep track of, uh, what I was doing at different times, if that's something of interest to me. You see here a project was created today and I was updated today. If we look at um, an older project, you can see I put in here 2020, this is when I was swatching. Um, so I have all my notes about what it is I'm thinking about doing as I'm planning for this project. Let's look at this one. This is, a, this is something I'm gonna work on for finish it February. And I put photos in here as well. I've got various notes from various different days here. Uh, but here is something that I find really interesting, especially when I put a project to the side. 
I can see 10 updates here. Um, so I click on that. And this shows me when I started the project on August uh, 11th. And I, because I keep track of percent increments, I can see my progress, uh, how, how much progress I was making on this. And then you can see that it's a zzz, two months pass. So I didn't do anything in, Octo in um, September or October. And then I picked it up again in November and I, and I got through probably with uh, one of the sleeves. For me, because I keep track of the percentages, I can get a rough idea of how long it actually took me to knit something because I don't always knit something straight through. And so I can see uh, what I did. So let's go back to uh, the projects. Now, one of the things that you can do, what I have up here is I have this organized with sets. And there's this thing right here that says organize. So if I click on that, uh, you can see that these are all the sets over on the left. I have sets for each year. So I, I keep uh, track when I use those tags and I put the years that I'm working on them. Um, they get sorted into these sets. So if I look at 2017, the, the, the tags for 2017 are just 2017. For feet, I if I tag something with slippers or socks, it will get put into my set with feet. If I have hands, it will be gloves, mittens, or mitts. I might use one of the any of those tags in there. If it's something um, that's a neck, it might be a cowl, a scarf, or I might have just typed the word neck. As I'm clicking on each of these, what you'll see over here are those projects that um, that I've sorted into there. And you can see for each of those projects what tags I use for that specific project. So some of my tags are just tags and I, and I use them for just sorting on projects. Like if I want to search projects, uh, anything I knit for my brother, I would just put his name in and then I can see, oh, these are the things that I've, I've made for my brother. They're not sorted into their own folder or into their own set. They're just uh, things where I, I knit this for my brother, so I made for Carl, and so I, uh, and the tags that I had were the year I made it, and then it was a hat. So it went into anything for 2015, a set, and, and the set uh, for things that were for heads. A few years ago when I was working on only projects that were unfinished, my UFOs, I created um, a set called 2016 UFOs, um, and but they also created a set that was called a 2016 New Finished Objects because I want to be able to keep track of new things that I made in 2016 or started in 2016. But I wanted to keep these all in their um, in their set, and so um, these are the things that I worked on that particular year. So that is a not so brief introduction to how to use your Ravelry notebook to track projects. So if you want to know how to use um, in more detail how to use different aspects, what I would do is go up to support at the bottom top of the screen and then go into help. Click on that and look help for help with uh, project uh, notebook. Let's see if that I will get and then you'll get uh, Thursday tips, you'll get different blog posts that they've made on how to uh, create, use the project page. So they have an overview, they have sorting and filters, how you can share your projects and all of that kind of thing. So you, there's always help on Ravelry um, for finding things on your own or you can ask in the forums. Now everybody's forum pages are going to look different, but there's a forum called For the Love of Ravelry where if you have a question about how Ravelry works, you could start a topic and ask that question within For the Love of Ravelry. So I want to talk about uh, Finish It February. I've been talking about it for the past few Casual Fridays and in, in a couple of weeks Finish It February is going to start. So I want to talk a little bit, uh, one of the reasons I wanted to show you how you could do create a, a Ravelry project in your Ravelry notebook is because if you want to kind of feel like you're doing this finish at February with other knitters, it's not, I wouldn't call it a knit along so much as like a just <laughs> we're all in this together type of thing. There is a, a thread in my Ravelry group on finish at February that somebody else actually started, but I'm going to do what's called 
uh, sticky it so that it always appears at the top of the discussion thread until the end of February. Um, and what you can do is if you want to, you can post photos of the things that you want to finish. Um, you can post photos of the things that you have finished during Finish It February. Um, you can do use it however you want. One of the ways that can be really uh, useful is if you have created a Ravelry project for that project and then you can use the tag like FIF um, 2021 or something like that as a tag and then we can use that as a way of searching who else is, is uh, doing finish it February we can we can search on that tag um, as people have finished their projects the other thing is that once you have created a Ravelry project and you've uploaded photos to it you can just link to our discussion thread to those uh, photos in your project page and we can look at those more easily. So it's just a, a way of kind of building skill set with these different tools so that you can use them and take a part in sort of the community of Finish It February. If you don't know what Finish It February is, it's an opportunity to pull out all of your unfinished objects, your UFOs that you have hiding in project bins or boxes or bags, just bringing them all out so that you can see what you have. And then making a decision about those particular projects. Is this something that you want to finish ever? Like, do you actually want this thing? If you were to finish it, would you actually want it? Or is there somebody who would want it? Um, or is it just something you feel like you should knit or should finish? So you would get to be the boss of your knitting. There are no rules here. It's just things to think about and approaches that might work uh, well for you and, and ways of thinking about this. So once you've identified your UFOs, you can then decide, you know, what gets priority. And for me, the priority is always the thing that's going to be the fastest, the thing that has a few ends to weave in. I can do that in a couple minutes and then I cross that off my list and I feel like I've, I finished something, I got it done. And part of your process of finishing it might be to take a project photo and post that in your Ravelry notebook or not. Whatever your process is, whatever makes something feel complete to you is, is, is what you can do. So for me, I like to start with the easy things first. And then I start looking at the bigger projects and some projects have a lot of parts to them. So it could be you're knitting a blanket and that blanket might be made up of a bunch of different squares um, that then have to be sewn together and then you have to put an edging around it. Or it might be something that's all knit in one piece but it does need an edging later. Or it might be that it has a lot of different ends to weave in. And, and so what I tend to do is break all of those sort of similar things as, as sub-projects. So a square would be a sub-project. So that is like a project. So I finished that square and then I might want to move on to something else in another project because I might want to keep things interesting to me. Sometimes the reason things get put to the side is because you get tired of them. And so the idea is to, is to keep you excited about finishing things, but what finished means can mean different things for different projects and to different knitters. So if you had this example of a blanket, you have different squares, maybe all of your squares are done and what you need to do now is seam everything up. Well, that might be a daunting process. Maybe you have 24 squares. So maybe one of your sub projects is just to sew together uh, four squares that make a strip or six squares that make a strip. That's a sub project. And then you can work on something else like the neck band of a sweater or something like that, the sock toe or weaving in ends, whatever it is. And then you might come back and do the next sub project of sewing the next strip together. So you have these things. And if you, if you get that sub project done and you're feeling really pumped up about this particular thing, maybe you do another strip. So you, you, it's flexible, it's fluid, it's what works for you. And so, but for me, it's, it's keeping that kind of rotation going. So another approach is to have, maybe you, is to only select three or four or five, whatever works for you. Uh, unfinished projects and you just create like you know one two three four five you work on number one for some number of hours maybe it's five hours maybe it's ten hours whatever that time period is when that time when you've spent that much time on that project 
then it goes to the back of the, of the line and now you work on number two. And so you just rotate through those projects until one of them is finished. And at that point, you can add a new one to that group of five if you want, if that's what's going to work for you. Or maybe you decide that for the month of February, you would like to complete these three things or these four things, whatever it is, you can rotate through them or you can do them one at a time, whatever works for you. And then when you get that done, then maybe your reward is you can start a new project or maybe you'll be so excited about finishing things that you want to start finishing more things. Again, whatever works for you. I know that there's one person who watches the channel who decided that this is going to be the year that she finishes projects. So she's already started on it. And that's what I did in 2016. I had like 40 unfinished projects and I spent most of the year just finishing those things. And I did set up a system where I wanted to make sure I had variety and I was working on this thing and then that thing and to keep it exciting and interesting to me so that I never felt like anything was a slog. Sometimes you're going to have uh, projects that you're really ambivalent about. Like what you've done so far is pretty good, but maybe you're not that excited about finishing it. You don't want to say, I'm never going to finish it. And you can choose to keep it. I kept several projects in sort of my UFO pile for a number of years. And I still have one from 2016 that I haven't decided is, is I'm never finishing. It's, it's, it's there. Someday I may feel like I want to finish it, but I haven't wanted to so far. But there have been other projects like a sweater where I had all the pieces knit. And I thought all I needed to do was sew them all together. And I realized um, when I actually sat down and said, okay, this is the year I'm going to finish it, I realized that the pieces were different lengths that I hadn't knit them so that they would match up correctly. And that was probably why it got put to the side. I'm like, well, I'm never going to finish this. This is off my plate. I'm not going to rip it out and reball it up. I'm just returning this yarn to my stash as being available. So it's available, but it's off my UFO radar and I can carry forward. A lot of this is just telling a story to yourself about <laughs> there's nothing that's different about the project um, except your decision about what you're going to do with it and, and what status it has as a work in progress versus um, a work that's never going to be in progress again and, and I am done with it. I saw that one person in my Ravelry group is going to use Finish It February as a way to finish up a variety of different craft projects. So some are knitting, maybe sewing, other types of crafts so that they she can get all of those things off her plate and then when the spring comes she can start new things and not have sort of that feeling of I've got all these unfinished things and um, I, that I really ought to be doing, but I really want to do this. You don't have that conflict going on if you um, just address all of those things. Now for me, because I've been doing Finish It February uh, regularly for the past few years, I don't have a lot of UFOs. I do have a project that is unfinished and it is this my new office. So I painted my office, I moved things in, I'm, it's functioning, I'm using it, but my old office still has some stuff in it and it hasn't been turned into my daughter's uh, bedroom. This used to be her bedroom. All of the furniture for both girls are in all crammed like ceiling to floor with their furniture and you can't even go into that particular room. So, so I have a project where I'm going to paint that old room I'm going to empty out everything that's that's still in there. Then I'm going to put all her furniture in there. And then I'm going to take all of this. Uh, and, and then I'm going to take everything in this closet that's hers and, and move that into her new bedroom. And then I'm going to uh, fill up this closet with stuff that I have stored um, in that same room that's uh, floor to ceiling, like my spinning equipment and my fiber for spinning and things like that. So I will break that down into sub projects and I'll, try to see if I can get one of those done each week in addition to the actual knitting projects that I'm going to be working on in February, um, which is two sweaters, one of which needs one sleeve and one that needs two sleeves. So those are my projects for Finish It February. And so I'll spend the, uh, the next couple of weeks getting ready for that. But again, I don't have to wait till February to start if I don't want to. Um, but that is something if you want to, um, 
I feel like you're part of the group, there will be the, the Ravelry discussion thread where you can post photos of what you hope to finish and then post photos of what you have finished, as well as creating Ravelry um, projects in your notebook and to see how you like it. So I finished this pair of toe-up socks I started a couple of weeks ago, and I've mentioned before, so this is the pair of socks, uh, I've mentioned before that I'm not uh, a fan of knitting toe-up socks. I've knit two socks toe-up in the past that were not part of the same pair. I love cuff-down construction, and I know a lot about modifying fit um, based on fit issues, regardless of the type of heel. So that's the kind of thing I've in, I'm interested in is uh, how do you adjust uh, for fit, depending on what the person's fit issue is and customizing uh, for a good fit. So I did a tutorial this August sock knit along tutorial about a year and a half ago. There's really in depth on customizing fit and then how you make those modify, how you identify what, what your fit issues are, then how to modify the type of heel that you would like to knit in order to make it fit your foot with your feet foot issues. So I know a lot about different types of heels and toes and fit issues and, and all of that, but I've never enjoyed toe-up sock construction and a lot of that has to do with prejudices I formed when I was a new sock knitter. This was before Ravelry, so it was like 2005, 2006, the first year I was learning to knit socks and I was trying everything, different heels, different everything. It was really difficult at the time to find information on toe up socks and especially information on fit issues. And the other thing was that the type of heel, like there's certain types of heels that work in both directions, like short row heels, but I don't enjoy knitting short row heels. I like short rows <laughs> like that. No tons of ways of doing it, done tons of videos on it, but I don't like working short rows so that you're making a turn next to the previous turn. I just, and I just find the process of short row heels tedious. Lots of people love them, fit them great. Um, but the problem that I had early on was I didn't enjoy knitting them and they didn't fit me. So over time, I eventually figured out how to make a short row heel fit me. Uh, and I got some really nice results, but I still didn't enjoy knitting short row heels. <laughs> so. So that was never an enticement that, well, you can work short row heels in both directions because I didn't like working them cuff down, so knitting them toe up was not an enticement. And another issue for me is just the psychology of the direction of construction and increasing the number of stitches as they go up the foot and you know needing to have it to be larger and versus the, the psychology of of decreasing as you're going toward the toe and how it feels like you're speeding up versus how it feels like you're slowing down. So a lot of it has nothing to do with anything objectively better or worse about the construction. I just didn't like it. <laughs> so I try to get over knitting prejudices that, that I have. And so for me, the way to do that, um, oh, the other thing is I didn't like the types of, of toes that um, were available, which is basically reversing the same toes that I could do a cuff down, and but substituting increases for decreases. I don't like increase shaping as much as decrease shaping. I like the look of decreases more than the look of increases if I have to choose. So that, you know, that was another thing. So I wasn't really interested in creating the same types of toes just in reverse. So one of the things that I was looking for is what can I only do toe up that I can't do cuff down that would be interesting for me to learn about. And so that was what I did with this first sock project is that get over that hurdle of the psychology of the stitches increasing um, by using a toe that doesn't, re that doesn't reverse an existing toe I had. In fact, has a toe that only works or toe up. And so that was this, um, this toe is this garter, it starts with the garter stitch square. It does require picking up some stitches. It does require a provisional cast on, all of which I really enjoy doing. Um, but there are no increases going up the foot. 
and I was able to use the same type of heel that I use, as I've been using the past year, cuff down. So in many ways, it was it 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 wasn't a whole lot different than doing cuff down. So the difference was in um, I got to do something new for the toe. And I got and I and I found a new way of working what's called an outline stitch bind off or half hitch uh, bind off, which is a type of sewn bind off that's nice and stretchy, and it replicates the exact look of the long tail cast on, which I really enjoy working for cuff down. So I was really pleased that I was able to use. I, I got a new version of a technique that I always liked the look of, but I found difficult or kind of futzy to work, and this one is so much easier. So I did a technique video on that like a week and a half ago on this type of bind off. Um, I've done videos on this kind of uh, sock heel. It's called the plain heel. It's just like a peasant heel, afterthought heel, only you do it when you get to that port of the sock. So if you're working cuff down, when you get to the heel, you work that peasant heel. Uh, and if, or if you're working toe up, when you get to the time, it's time to start the heel, you do it then. You don't have to come back and do it later. So I've done a lot of videos on that. Um, so I'm going to do a video on this toe. I'm not sure I love wearing it yet. It has a different texture because it's garter stitch and I'm very aware of it. So I'm gonna have to wear these socks or I have to weave in a few ends. And I'm gonna wear these socks and see what I think of them. Some people with just regular socks, they don't like the stockinette sole with the pearl bumps that touch their feet. They and so they knit what's called a princess sole, and so that the flat stockinette portion is on the inside and the pearl part is on the outside, and that's more comfortable for them. So it could just be that it's a texture difference that I'm not used to, but I'll get used to it right away, but, it, but I'm aware of it. So that's something I'm gonna look out for. One of the things I've been thinking about a lot lately is just different construction methods that are available to make different kinds of garments and accessories and how oftentimes there is a traditional way of doing something uh, or that or there's a way that we think of as being the traditional way and then we have ways a variety of ways that we use today some of which are more popular than others and we don't always realize how much variety that there had been in the past but because I didn't want to work a standard wedge toe or a standard sort of star toe in reverse using increases, I've been interested in looking at alternatives for toes, but I also have been interested in looking at other alternative construction methods for socks. And I got two vintage books in, in the mail recently that are from the late 1940s and early 1950s. And they're uh, from Beehive, and I'll do an overhead to, to show you kind of what, uh, what they are. They have a couple of different techniques in there. One is something called the Aladdin heel, and it's a way of putting a sock heel in your sock that makes it easier to remove later so that it can be re-knit. And they do it in a way that's visually obvious so that when you do have to, uh, using a contrast yarn at the places where uh, you would be taking this apart. And they do that in order to make it easier to, to take apart because the idea is that's gonna be inside a shoe. Nobody, the general public isn't going to see that, but it will make it easier to take it out later. So the other innovation or other uh, difference is something called um, beehive sock innovation. And it, it included the Aladdin heel, but it also included uh, a way of working the sole separately from the instep. You still work the toe in the round, but when you graft the toe, they want you to use the contrast yarn as well, so that if you need to take the toe out, that it will be easier to do. And one of the things about these innovation socks is not only were they knit so that you had to seam them, but they were knit in ways that allowed for alternative directions of construction like being knit sideways, for example, versus it's, it wasn't that it was knit toe up, it was that it was knit sideways, um, and then it was attached to this special kind of heel and the sole was there, you know, there just a, a lot of variation, which I thought was really interesting. So I've been thinking about that lately, these different construction methods, and I decided to look through a book I bought, I don't know, about, it was when I first heard about the plain heel, I'd already figured out on my own 
how to make this plain heel, this sort of insta-thought peasant heel. But somebody mentioned that it was known as the plain heel in a book called The Sock Knitter's uh, Workshop. So this is a book that was originally written in German and it was translated. So I bought the book and this gave me the clue about, the initial clue about how to modify this version of the peasant heel in order to get a better fit, like if you have a high instep. They had, they had one gauge, one a stitch count, and I had to use that to figure out how can you make this work for any, any foot. Um, but I decided to look through this again and see what it said about toe-up socks. And it had, has a couple of really good ideas. It has a, a toe that's similar to this square garter stitch. It's more of a strip. Uh, so that's kind of an interesting thing. But it also has some other types of ways of approaching toes when you want to knit the rest of the sock. Um, toe up and it includes combining different directions of knitting so you could use a provisional cast on and knit the toe that you normally like that you really like the way it fits using your decreases or you could do a short row toe like you um, uh, would might do anyway with a cuff down or toe up sock and then work the rest of the sock toe up so that is an intriguing possibility to me so you start with a provisional cast on and you just work the toe and then you come back to the provisional cast on and work the rest of the, the sock toe up. That's something I am interested in. I'm not sure if, I'll, if, if I'm going to make any of the socks from uh, either one of these books, these two uh, books that I got, which I'm gonna show you uh, with an overhead to kind of show you what these socks are like. I'm intrigued by them, but I, I will see. I might. It might be a, a situation where I make one of them just to understand and and experience it. We'll see. But I'm going to show you um, the overhead of these vintage socks next. These books are both from Beehive, which is a Peyton's company. So this one is is number 57. I believe it was from. It's a post World War II pattern. So you see a lot of these kind of color work things. The, this sock is knit in this direction. So th this color work, so you're knitting stripes, you know, this, this color and then this color work thing, but you're knitting um, this way. You're not knitting cuff down. And I believe the same is true for, for these socks. These are all knit sideways. So this one, you can kind of see the seam on the side here. And I'm not sure how well you can see that there, there is a little bit of contrast here and here. What you can see at the very end of the toe is the contrast yarn where that was grafted together with contrast yarn to make it easier to take out later. So this seam isn't meant to really particularly be hidden. Um, it's meant so that the, the knitter can, can find it and take it out. Um, at a later time. So they do have socks that were knit on the round, like these would have been knit on the round, but they still would have had this Aladdin heel. And you can see the contrast yarn uh, along the edge of the heel there. And you can see the contrast yarn for the graft here at the side as well. This almost looks like a seam, but it's just a crease in the in the photograph. So the first one I showed you was number 57. Uh, and the, the second one here is number 62. So this is probably from at least a couple of years later. So again, you can see these socks where you have the heel has some contrast uh, thread along the side. But these are socks that are knit in a solid color. And so they're knit in the round, they're not knit flat. Uh, but again, they have this replaceable heel that they've uh, put in it. These are really cool. These would have been knit flat from uh, the, top, the cuff down. So here is a picture of this innovation. And this is true for some of the socks, but not all of them. Some of these are knit exactly this way, and particularly in this particular book, but some of them are not. So this piece of fabric is written in this T shape. Sometimes they do it this way where they have a little bit here and a little bit here, so it's symmetrical. Uh, there was one of them I read where they had all of this uh, excess part all on one side of it so that the seam wouldn't have been up the back of the leg. So the way that this was knit is you knit this first and then you pick up stitches 
along here and then cast on stitches and then pick up stitches along here so uh, across the back so you've picked up along this little edge cast on stitches and then picked up across the other one and you knit the heel at that point and then um, you add your contrast yarn you knit the 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 sole and you work the toe and you graft it with your contrast yarn and then you you come back and you knit this little separate piece of fabric for the back of, of the leg so that you have this this is all in ribbing so I guess this is to help keep a snugger fit and then you, you so you have multiple seams you have seams on each side of here you have um, an edge here that you're seaming and you have you have seams in various places so it's kind of fascinating that they would have put up with that much seaming not just to do but i am curious about how it would fit or how it would feel when you were wearing the sock i just love these socks from the late 40s and 50s they were really cool looking but a lot of them were not knit in the round because the stitch patterns wouldn't have allow uh, wouldn't have allowed for that um, and and so you'd need to do seaming in order um, to knit them but they're pretty fancy like look at these plaid looking ones and then there are some solid color ones, um, more basic types of socks here. Um, so this is one where it looks like woven. They are doing some kind of a, a weaving technique in order to uh, create that effect. So lots of really cool things that you just don't see nowadays. And then here's some uh, pictures of how that Aladdin heel works as well. Well, that's it for this week's Casual Friday. If you have any comments or questions about today's video or suggestions for videos you'd like to see in the future, you can leave those down in the comments below or join the discussion in my Ravelry group, Rocks Rocks. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next week.